What I'm saying is by putting in automated facilities to stay competitive against other countries, you're also have you're going to have to increase that skill set, and that means more focus on STEM in our schools, more fo- more focus on workforce development, and really hiring uh, and building up a talented workforce domestically that can help us be successful against competition that once again may have certain subsidies that makes it makes it very difficult for domestic. Um, Uh, manufacturers to compete against. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Altium On Track podcast. I am your host, Zach Peterson, and today uh, we are sitting down with President and CEO of Isola Group, Travis Kelly. Uh, He is also the chairman of the Printed Circuit Board Association of America. He's been quite active recently uh, lobbying for the industry, and uh, we're very excited to talk to him, especially in the wake of some new legislation that has been introduced in the U.S. Congress. Travis, thank you so much for being here today. Yeah, thank you very much, Zach, for having me. Absolutely. Um, You know, this is a a side of the industry that we don't talk about much on the podcast, but, you know, I think this is a a monumental, maybe not monumental, but a big turning point for the industry, and I'm I'm hoping the momentum can be maintained, uh, especially with, uh, you know, legislation coming out around semiconductors. It's interesting now to see something coming out around printed circuit board manufacturing as well. Yeah, I agree, Zach. I think more people, you know, and that's government and the public sector are becoming more conversant on the ecosystem, which we know as microelectronics. And a lot of the focus, to your point, is on semiconductors. Uh, However, we have a saying at the PCBAA that chips don't float, meaning that even if you build the foundries in the United States to hopefully circumvent some of the global supply chain issues all of us are experiencing, You still have numerous issues if you can't embed those chips onto a printed circuit board. And I think as we continue to educate and advocate and obviously legislate for our industry, people are becoming more aware of not only the the nuances within the microelectronics industry, but just how complicated it is. Yeah, absolutely. And I I think there, I I agree with you. I think there is kind of a disconnect. Um, But maybe before we we talk about that, you could introduce yourself to the audience, give us a, a sense of your background and, you know, how you became to, to uh, be involved in all of this and how you got to involved in the printed circuit board industry. Yeah, I appreciate that, Zach. So I am the president and CEO of Isola Group. And Isola Group is American-based. We have facilities all over the world, um, but we have two very large facilities in the United States. And we make material uh, called laminate and customer prepreg that is crucial to the manufacturing of printed circuit boards. And ultimately, uh, I've been the CEO and president now for over three years of Isola Group and working very closely with some of the largest PCB uh, fabricators in the United States, we saw a significant need that there has to be more attention given to this declining base. Um, So just some quick stats that I think can help uh, educate and make your um, uh, population of viewers uh, more conversant on this topic. PCB worldwide production revenue is estimated to be over 60 billion in 2021. All right, so last year. Over the past 20 years, PCB production has moved away from the United States. And a lot of us know that. However, at an alarming rate. Um, At one time, the U.S. produced roughly 26% of the world's PCBs. Today, that number is down to 4%. If I want to quantify that in terms of overall fabricators and PCBA, you're basically basically looking at over 2,000 fabricators in the late 1990s, early 2000 to less than 140 today. So that's draconian when you think about such a a paradigm shift in in the industry itself. Um, While the PCB manufacturing today, to your point, is garnering new momentum based on the global supply chain issues, you know, COVID really uh, shined a light on a lot of our weakness as a domestic uh, manufacturing base, not only not only for microelectronics, but, you know, pharmaceuticals, industrial equipment, that I think there is a lot of momentum right now relative to what we need to do as an industry to ensure that not only can we um, have a robust 
domestic supply chain, but also a trusted one. You know, as you get into reliance on foreign PCB manufacturing, it's a problem for the U.S. companies that rely on PCBs for their products. Um, so when you think about some of the disruptions that not only have we seen since 2020, but also we're, we're going to continue to see not only because of container shortages, as well as the, you know, the, the rolling blackouts in China because of their zero go, uh, COVID policy, and the war in Ukraine, we're going to continue to see these global disruptions. And I think right now is the, the perfect time to bring awareness to the overall industry, government, that something has to get done. And it's extremely important to uh, ensure that we have a trusted and resilient ecosystem as it relates to printed circuit boards and overall the microelectronics industry. Yeah, I absolutely agree. And um, I think it's interesting that it took you know, the failure of a just-in-time supply chain that was highly concentrated overseas to, to really drive this. You know, back in, I think, 2016, uh, when the Trump administration began, um, there was kind of this renewed focus on onshoring, but, you know, everybody questioned it. Um, it was across different industries. It wasn't just electronics. And, you know, now we're in this position where I think the, the geographic uh, clustering of your manufacturing capacity has really revealed a major weakness which is if people can't go in and work in the factories, then you don't have manufacturing capacity anymore, especially if it's all clustered overseas. Yeah, that's right, Zach. And you, you touched on an important point just there, because I think, you know, in the prior administration, it, it, I think sometimes it was looked through a myopic lens where people were saying, hey, it's onshoring and reshoring. And that's not what we're advocating for. We as an industry recognize that we work in a global economy. And there's certain benefits, too, by diversifying your manufacturing capabilities in certain regions. What we're saying is the number is not 100 percent, right? That's a myopic view, and, and I think that that's a, um, a heavy lift to convince people, even, even our own industry, that that makes sense. But I also know the number is not 4 percent, right? We need to, so, so we have to define what is resilient. You know, a lot of the times, I think the, the counter-argument uh, to what we're trying to accomplish is, hey, is it really necessary to have printed circuit boards for your toaster oven coming from the U.S.? I would make an argument that that, that is not critical, right? That is not a critical um, component of what, we're, of what we're advocating and legislating for. What we're saying is if you look at certain sectors, where do we want to ensure that we have the trusted and resilient supply chain? What are those sectors? That obviously would be defense. Uh, aerospace, medical, um, banking, right? We, we understand that, you know, as you look at data, data farms, data servers, and the importance of having continuity and not having, you know, certain issues happen uh, in the financial sector, that's extremely important. So really, when we look at what is critical and, and what's defined as critical, infrastructure like 5G and ultimately 6G, that to me would make sense to have a robust supply chain domestically. Right. We're not asking, we're not advocating to have every toaster built in the United States. We are saying, let's carve out what we think as a nation is extremely important and tackle those issues. Sure. Um, I think what you brought up here with uh, the objectively right number, I mean, what is that objectively right number? Because if, if you look at semiconductors and you look at the stats, there's, there's less of a differential between what happens domestically versus what happens overseas. I mean, it's not, you know, 4%, it's a bit higher, but it's, you know, certainly less of a differential. So for printed circuit boards, what is the right number? Um, because I think the danger here is that we get on this big onshoring kick and there's so much momentum that all of the new capacity is at home. And then we're just in this situation again where we've just over-concentrated capacity. We've just done it locally instead of overseas. Do you see that as a danger? Yeah, I, I think you don't want to over-index on one or the other. I think as we continue to get our voice around what makes sense to the overall industry, you know, it will become more clear on what the right number is. But, you know, I, I enjoy numbers. I think, you know, the, the facts shall set you free. So when we look at just defense spending, so there is some favorable language in the National Defense Authorization Act as it relates to printed circuit boards. If you look at defense spending and you look at what the U.S. domestic PCB um, suppliers and, and material suppliers like Isola Group contribute, it's roughly like 3% of the overall share of what we do. 
I think it would be hard for many domestic, you know, PCB fabricators, assemblers, and material suppliers to invest capital expenditures, capex dollars towards such a small volume, especially when you think about defense volume because it's somewhat um, transient. They'll have peaks and valleys depending on what's happening. So it's not a it's not a consistent demand signal. So it's hard to write an investment thesis from a business perspective to support volume that kind of ebbs and flows. What does all that mean? That means if we look once again at what, what do we think is critical? And if we all agree that critical would once again be infrastructure, 5G, 6G, and the evolution of that, medical, aerospace, obviously defense, um, banking, and there's several other ones that we could uh, put together, you could potentially get to an aggregated demand of roughly 26%. If you were to look at all those industries and try to solve for ensuring, once again, not only a trusted supply chain, but a resilient one, and then I think you start getting to the right number, right? You start getting to the right number, okay, if it's not 3% in terms of just defense work, but it's roughly 26%, I think a lot of the CEOs of the, of the PCB fabricators and the material suppliers can actually sit down and write an investment thesis saying, no, we need to build brick and mortar um, and by the way, it doesn't all have to be the U.S. It can be allied countries, but build brick and mortar to support that demand signal of roughly a quarter of the overall demand for PCBs. That to me resonates. And I think as we continue to work with industry, as we continue to work with government, I think there is a way to solve this equation without being myopic, saying everything has to be onshore, and, and, and as well as saying, hey, 4% is the right number. Because we know because of COVID, to your point, um, 4% is not the right number. And that's one reason we're struggling uh, as, as a microelectronics industry. Furthermore, to your point earlier, semiconductors, you can build the foundries in the United States, but if only if less than 3% of advanced packaging happens in, in the United States, when those chips come out, uh, out of those foundries, they still have to be sent overseas for packaging. So that's a significant problem as well. So it's really looking at the entire ecosystem, saying where are those vulnerabilities outside of just chips and, and advanced packaging, and how do we address each one of those? Sure. Um, and when you say allied countries, I mean, this could be North America, could be Western Europe, could really be anywhere that is uh, generally friendly in terms of trade. That's right, because I, I do think... Uh, I get fearful that you don't want to over-index. Um, that's typically what happens if it's a, a knee-jerk reaction and then you find unintended consequences when you do over-index. So I think, um, I think we have a nice balanced view, we being the Printed Circuit Board Association of America, saying, look, yes, we probably have to build brick and mortar in the United States. Um, that makes a lot of sense. But then when you look at allied countries, Germany, uh, potentially Japan, Canada, Mexico, how can we diversify enough so you're not, you're not putting all your eggs in one basket? Because you could have the same issue again. Right now, our issue is the fact that most of our material and, and our, our manufacturing comes from Asia. If you were to put it you know, domestically, you still have acts of gods like tornadoes and hurricanes that could wipe you out as well. So it's, once again, it's always about a balanced approach, not over-indexing one way or the other and figuring out strategically where does it make sense to, have, to build brick and mortar um, to have a resilient and robust supply chain as well as a trusted one, because I, I, I don't want to miss that point, to ensure that we can continue to run as a nation for this, these critical applications. Sure. And I, I wonder if you could maybe put some context here, because um, I think when people think or hear the word onshoring or reshoring, they think we're going to close down the factories over there and move all that capacity over here. And that's not always the case, is it? It's maybe looking at the growth projection for the industry as a whole and saying, if we're going to plan new capacity, maybe we should plan some of it domestically instead of internationally. Yeah, and that, that's a great point, Zach. Um, you're 100% correct. It doesn't mean closing current facilities, regardless of where they are located. It can mean for new demand, if you go back to my example of if you were to aggregate the demand signal from you know six or seven criti like defined critical um, applications and get that market share up to 26%, that would be incremental gain for a lot of our, um, not only our constituents as part of the PCBAA, but the industry as a whole. So you would expect with incremental demand, you would build in addition to what you currently have. 
So it's not really, it's not a zero sum game where it's plus one, minus one. And you would expect to see a, just a broader footprint from uh, our, our, um, our membership base. Sure, sure. Yeah, I think that all makes sense. And I think that's really the right way to talk about uh, shifting your capacity geographically, not necessarily closing it all down overseas and bringing it home, but maybe intelligent planning of where you set up new capacity, especially for the larger players. Yeah, because there's still um, there's still economic concern. Uh, you, you know, I think you and I briefly spoke um, about this a couple of weeks ago. You know, one thing we do know is no one learns anything from history, right? Everyone forgets, and and I think the key here is we still have to remain competitive as an industry. So you that would be difficult to do if everything was domiciled in one certain country be it the US Canada what have you so we have to be strategic about where we do build the brick and mortar um also what what new technology is out there to help us be competitive against certain countries that may subsidize their own internal industries so point being um Isola group built a state of the art uh, facility in Chandler Arizona back in 2019 and 2020 and it's fully automated so if you were to go into a plant that we built 10 years ago it would be uh, very different than what you're seeing now in Chandler because of all the automated presses uh, and, and robots the point being that there are ways you can reduce the overall cost and still manufacture domestically and not only that it helps with skilled jobs. So when you think about automation, not only do you still require a lot of the, the teammates that we have from an hourly side, but then you get into controls engineering, you get into electrical engineering. And, and the key here, Zach, and it's extremely important, you know, we've spent some time already talking about brick and mortar, but when, when you offshore, you're off, also offshoring that technological know-how. Right. So it's not like you're just building a plant someplace else. You're also building up their talent and really uh, reducing the talent needs here domestically. What I'm saying is by putting in automated facilities to stay competitive against other countries, you're also have you're going to have to increase that skill set. And that means more focus on STEM in our schools, more, fo more focus on workforce development and really hiring uh, and building up a talented workforce domestically that can help us be successful against competition that once again may have certain subsidies that makes, that makes it very difficult for domestic um, uh, manufacturers to compete against. You, you know, you're bringing up a lot of uh, points that were brought up in IPC's leadership loss report, and then there was a combined uh, Department of Homeland Security and Department of Commerce report that kind of echoed a lot of these issues with workforce development, education, um, lack of investment in uh, R&D for automation, controls, engineering, those types of things. Um, you know, you're, you're bringing up a lot of this stuff that I think has been known for a lot of years within the industry, now is being recognized a bit more broadly within the U.S. government. And then I'm wondering what, what really tipped the scales? What actually got somebody in Congress to actually listen up and realize that it's not just the semiconductors, it's also the printed circuit boards that matter for electronics manufacturing? Because I, I think when, when people think about tech, they think about technology, right? What do they think about? Well, they think Netflix, Facebook, Google, you know, they think the big software giants. And then maybe they get a little deeper and then they think Intel, AMD, NVIDIA. And then what? They don't ever go down to the printed circuit board. I, it's, there's still this, it seems to me there's still this perception that, you know, circuit boards are kind of an overblown way to wire together computer chips. And that was, I'll be honest, the perception I had about, you know, 20 years ago when I was still in college. Um, so I'm, I'm wondering what tips the scales for somebody in power and what's the message that resonates? Yeah, you know, <laughs> so you, you, you're spot on, Zach. And, you know, my kids, when they think about technology, it's cybersecurity, it's NVIDIA, it's chips, it's the big software. You know, no one really thinks, uh, you know, I say that our industry is not overly sexy, but it's absolutely critical. And I think what's resonating with people, Zach, and it's... Uh, you know, just, just allow me two minutes here because it's so important. You have the printed circuit boards, which, you know, people will say, oh, do you mean the green pieces of plastic? There's so much more than that, right? They are truly, you know, they, they, that is what a chip gets embedded into, 
right? Without that printed circuit board and the different pathways for the electronic signals that carries the ones and zeros, nothing works. When you actually bifurcate this discussion and get into, okay, well, what is a printed circuit board? And then you tear off that soldering, the green, you know, the green plastic, the soldering plate, and you look, then it becomes laminate and prepreg. And once again, that's something Isola does. And people don't really know what that is. And, and I'm, not, I'm not overly sure they need to, but they do need to understand that outside, Isola is the only U.S. Uh, material supplier left that has the broad suite of products that can cover FR4 material, HSD. It, we, we cover the gambit, but we're the last ones in the United States. To scare people even more, and I've had this discussion uh, with the executive agent uh, appointed uh, by the, the U.S. government that oversees the PCB industry, if you look at what laminate is, and, and it's basically woven glass, we, we, we get woven glass and you have copper, Here's, here's a scary part, uh, point, Zach. There's only one uh, yarn company left in the United States that makes yarn that has to be woven into the woven glass, and that's AGY. And there's one uh, copper supplier left in South Carolina. So when, as you, that my point being, as you further bifurcate this discussion and really educate people on the ecosystem itself, it is scary how decimated the industry has been, meaning that if one of these suppliers were to go out of business, it would be nearly impossible to produce a printed circuit board in the U.S. Now, sure, you could go and get you know woven glass from Asia or yarn from Asia. You could potentially get copper you know from China. But once again, then we go back. Well, do you really consider that a robust supply chain? Do you really consider that a resilient domestic supply chain? So people have. To your point, like how do people start waking up? I think as we continue and, and we meet with the White House and, and a lot of different um, functions of the government, obviously DOD, uh, we're back in Washington next week um, to, to have further meetings uh, with uh, Congress. People are opening their eyes because I, I think it, it's somewhat scary to see how vulnerable we are when you really get into who are the suppliers and what does it take to make a final system, right? We had a good discussion with some defense primes and, and some Congress people two weeks ago in Washington, and they look at things from a system perspective, right? So if it's a missile system from Raytheon, when you start you know, tearing that apart and looking at the different components all the way down into the precious materials that's required, it starts raising a lot of eyebrows when you see that you know some of the critical components that are needed there may only be one sole provider, one sole source left in the in the U.S. Well, it, it seems that the messaging has been effective to some extent because just uh, this month, uh, or in May, I should say, uh, the uh, there was a bill introduced. The uh, I believe it's the Supporting uh, Printed Circuit Boards Act uh, or Supporting American Printed Circuit Boards Act of 2022, uh, introduced by uh, Representatives uh, Ishu and Representatives Moore, uh, and uh, it's a, a bipartisan sponsorship, which I think is is remarkable. I I think usually when you think you know American manufacturing, you think about one side of the aisle and not the other. Um, so it it seems that the messaging here is hitting where it needs to, which is both sides of the aisle. And now you've got the introduction of a bill that intends to address some of these problems and hopefully make the industry, at least domestically, a bit more competitive. What What's your sense about the bill? Do you think it has a chance of actually passing? Do you think it's too little too late? Well, I'd, I'd like to get your thoughts on this. Yeah, so first and foremost, you know, the, the Printed Circuit Board Association of America is grateful to both representatives, Ishu and, and Blake, uh, more for taking on this important issue. And, and, and it's quite interesting because the bill supports, you know, really a couple different things. Expansion of U.S. production capacity of integrated circuit substrates, uh, the relocation of facilities from certain countries to the U.S. or allied countries. Um, it's a great question. You know, do, do I think it's too little too late? I think it's the right start. I, I, I'm very happy that the, the, the bill was introduced compared to where, you know, the PCBAA has only been around for a year. And when I look at the consequential things that we've accomplished in such a short period of time, you know, I'm very pleased with, um, with some of the early successes. And the fact that printed circuit boards are even being discussed at this level is fantastic. You know, we've had members, members of the PCBAA that um, took a direct, I'll, I'll say, um, 
route with the, the new legislation that was introduced, uh, helping push it through um, with both representatives. Obviously, we have sister organizations like USPAE, obviously IPC that are also proponents um, for the, this new bill. So really, you know, just everyone <clears throat> working together to ensure that we get PCBs out, you know, uh, out in the forefront on, on the critical nature of what, the, what what is needed to ensure that these systems work. So is it too little too late? No. Is it is it the solve all? Absolutely not. But it's a beginning. And, and, and you know, we need all the um, all our members, all IPC members to continue to urge Congress to pass this. Um, it's hard for me to sit here based on, you know, I'll say the geopolitical environment uh, and forecast. Will it be passed? Um, I, what I do know is obviously it, there's a lot of different polling happening. Um, you know, obviously the midterm elections are up for debate. You know, a lot of people are saying it's going to be a red wave. But then with, um, you know, the Supreme Court leak, you know, will that will that steer it more back towards the Democrats. I, I wish I, I wish I had a crystal ball. I think anyone that makes a prediction right now is truly guessing. Here's where I'm comfortable though. I'm comfortable that this is a bipartisan issue. I do believe with the continued shutdowns in China and, and those ports continuing to stack up where you so Manufacturers can't get containers, um, and, and, we're, and we haven't even really seen the ramifications of that yet. We've all been dealing with it for two years, but with the port issues that continue to mount in Asia and with the further shutdowns, I don't think we've experienced the, the true impact as of yet. I think we will experience over the next couple months. I don't see this issue going away. So I think because it's a bipartisan issue, I think because of the war in the Ukraine, because of the issues uh, throughout China with the, the zero COVID-19 policy, and then ultimately just trying to get any type of material uh, into, um, into the U.S., you know, I'm not even mentioning the inflation, everything that's happening from a macroeconomic standpoint, I just, I, I, I struggle to believe that this, um, that this bill won't be passed sometime, in, you know, in the next several months. Now, several months could be, you know, well after midterms, but um, I just think there's so much momentum behind it that, and I think the the general public understands now the risk we all face when we don't have a resilient supply chain. Well, I, I agree. I think it's it's much more top of mind for the everyday person that uh, you know a resilient supply chain, however you want to define that, is important, especially when you have you know. Uh, stories on the news every night about how you can't buy a Ford F-150 or something like that. <laughs> you know, these crazy things about auto chip shortages. And I think that's what really brought it to the forefront was, you know, with the automotive sector. Um, my, my concern here is that we've overdone it on the semiconductor subsidy or the semiconductor, uh, the CHIPS Act and uh, the related uh, legislation that's gone to support the semiconductor industry, but we're just going to underdo it on the PCBs because the PCBs are kind of an afterthought when, you know, as you've rightly stated, the reality is the chips don't matter if you can't connect them together on something that properly routes signals around the board. So I'm I'm wondering what, what is it that's going to take that kind of shift in mindset and possibly help maintain the momentum towards making the printed circuit board industry competitive again for the U.S. and, and I guess for our you know, allies and partners more broadly. Yeah, Zach, and I, and I think that was really one of the catalysts to form in the PCBAA. You know, when you, we look at our three pillars, educate, advocate, and legislate, you're hitting the nail on the head, right? Because the, the focus, the, you know, the headlines in the Wall Street Journal and pretty much any paper is always about semiconductors because that's what the, that's what the consumer sees, right? I want my F-150. I used to be able to go to the lot. I could pick it up that day and drive it home. And now the lots are bare. I'm paying more for a used car than when it was new five years ago. That, that's what resonates with people because it's hitting their own personal pocketbooks. We need, we being the PCBAA, to continue to educate and advocate. 
And, you know, did we over index on semiconductors? Possibly. Obviously, it is an issue. And I think it is an issue that needs to be resolved. You know, does 52 billion should should I just go to foundries or do, does someone need to look at the ecosystem? And actually, we, we talked about this in Washington a couple of weeks ago with certain Congress people and, and certain constituents. How do you take that bill and add to it, right? Or how do you bifurcate the $52 billion to start beefing up the other sectors that are all part of microelectronics? Because I think the key here is chips don't float. So you're not addressing the root cause. It's no different than running a manufacturing company. When, when I meet with my engineers, should we have an issue? You have to identify the root cause of the issue to put in corrective action. If you're not doing that, then you're just addressing the symptoms, right? So a symptom, a symptom is I can't get my, one, my F-150 today. That's not the root cause. So then people say, well, okay, the root cause is the, the chips. I can't get the chips. That's not the root cause. Right. It's part of it, but part of it's the advanced packaging that can only be done in Asia. Only three percent is done here and not at scale. So you're not going to be able to get, you know, um, 400 or 500,000 F-150s out by producing uh, or doing advanced packaging in the States because we don't do it at that scale. We can, but we don't today. You know, what about, you know, the printed circuit boards? So once again, it's looking at what, you know, Congress has already approved and saying, okay, does it make sense? How do we divvy up the funds to make sure the entire ecosystem is resilient, to your point? Because if we're just going to over-index on semiconductors, that's great. We'll have a lot of foundries. But then, you know, there, and I know there's articles out there, and, and I'm on top of a lot of them. There's arguments saying we're going to make the supply chain worse because now they're, now they're produced in the United States. Now you have to send them to Asia and then send them back as opposed to just having them produced in Asia and send them here. So there's a whole argument that we're actually going to tie up the global supply chain even worse than what it was because we're building foundries and nothing else. So uh, I I do know it's resonating um, because we're hearing it when we go to Washington. People are understanding more and more each day that, hey, this is a bigger issue than just I can't get my F-150 today. But we have to continue as the PCBAA to educating. And, And we spend a lot of time, almost a week, a month in Washington just doing that. Making sure that you know the, the not only the the House but the Senate, the Armed Services Committee, even the White House was briefed that this this is just a bigger issue than semiconductors. You brought up a great point about shipping uh, shipping overseas because you're right. If you you can make all the chips you want locally, but if there's no local assembly capacity, then you have to ship that all out overseas, and you're still you still have the risk of IP exposure, and then you have to ship it back. I'm from from uh, from what you've just said. You know, not only does that tie up the supply chain, which I I can see and understand the argument for that, but how does that impact the cost of the end product? Because if I make it over here, right? I'm gonna let's just assume that you don't add any cost to the to the actual uh, device, the the semiconductor that you produce over here, but you have to ship it out overseas, and then you have to ship it back. And let's assume that there's still tariffs in place on both ends. In that case, how does that impact the competitiveness? If we just said, hey, we can be competitive on cost by cutting out all these shipping costs and tariffs and everything else um, by producing it locally and by assembling it locally, is that something that also resonates? Is this, you know, then become kind of a cost issue? Yeah, it it has to. It it has to. Because ultimately, in 2019, so pre-COVID, you could get a shipping container. So when you think about the, the large vessels and you see the big you know, steel boxes, that, that's what I mean by when I say, uh, say container. Those containers were anywhere from $2,000 to $2,500. So you would lease that container. You would put your material in it. Material could be a printed circuit for it. It could be a semiconductor, whatever it is, right? I mean, you can put clothes in it, toys, toys go in it. So you would, you would lease that for roughly $2,000. That was pre-COVID. Right now, it's costing anywhere between $20,000 and $28,000. So when people are saying, geez, I'm paying more for groceries, I'm paying, you're paying more for everything, it's not all because of shipping containers, but that cost has to go somewhere. So when you say, Travis, you know, not only would this be you know, less of a resilient supply chain, is there an economic impact? 100% there is. Because right now, if you're, if you're importing semiconductors that have been packaged, you're arguably, you know, arguably paying, let's say, $20,000 just to use round numbers. That's just coming from Asia into the United States. If you build the foundry here 
and you don't do packaging and you don't do PCBs and you do have to send it back to Asia, now you're spending $20,000 to go back to Asia and $20,000 to come back to the U.S. to go into your F-150, to use your example. So now it's 40 grand. So you don't need to be an economist to say this is going to cost us more money. And I think that's why you're seeing a lot of articles right now where people are saying, hey, time out. You know, we fully appreciate that semiconductors should be protected. We should do something domestically. But if you're only going to address that symptom and not the root cause, in theory, you know, and I know you could probably argue this one way or the other, but in theory, you're not only going to spend more money now and, and make things cost more, you're also making the supply chain less resilient because now you got to go both ways. And not only is the cost of containers gone up, but also it's hard to find a container. Um, so what's happening is even Isola, when we build material, we can achieve, let's say, a customer's you know, lead time but then you may not be able to get the container for three weeks out because right now a lot of those ships are either at ports that are struggling because of the zero COVID policy um, or, or, you know, the war in Ukraine. Or we're doing slow steaming. If you remember, it used to be on the news quite a bit. You would see all the ships out on the West Coast waiting to get into port. If you look now or you fly into Los Angeles, you'll see ships, but you won't see as much that used to be on the news. That's not because there isn't an issue. That's because they've all been told to go uh, to slow steam. Slow steam means they just go across the ocean slower so you don't have that buildup. So it's not in the public eye, but it's still happening. Just, uh, just you don't see it. So when you take a lot of these things into consideration and you just focus, to your point, on semiconductors, I would have a, I, I would have a strong argument saying we're not addressing the root cause and we, we potentially have an unintended consequence where we're going to make things worse. And look, you know, it's okay. easy for me to sit, and just to be clear, it's easy for me to sit here and poke holes uh, in everything that's happened. And that's not my intent. I, I'm very happy with the government. I'm very happy. I think that they're addressing the issue with semiconductors. I think the industry as a whole understands that there is an, uh, an issue with the industry. And what do we need to make sure we have uh, secure and, uh, and resilient supply chains? All I'm saying is we have to do more. Right. But I, like I said, I'm very happy that the uh, Supporting America PCBs Act was introduced. I think that's a huge win. I think a year ago, no one knew what a PCB was, except for a handful of us that are in the industry. Now it's being you know, debated at that level, which is fantastic. Now we're having the, the, the discussions around semiconductors. Now we have automotive companies having discussions. So, you know, I'm very happy with what I'm seeing. What we're trying to do at the next level is just make people converse and on the entire ecosystem. Let's let's talk about the one yarn supplier that's left in the U.S. Let's talk about the one laminate and prepreg, you know, full suite of services supplier that's left in the U.S., the copper supplier. You know, it's just it's a bigger issue that we just need to make sure we're all sitting down and discussing. Doesn't mean that, you know, you're going to swing one way or the other, but let's make conscious decisions moving forward on what makes sense as an industry overall. You know, there's been a, a recent trend uh, of like Apple and Tesla and other companies uh, making their own chips, doing the doing the design, and then probably contracting with you know another fab house, TSMC or whoever else to to get it made. Um, I'm wondering, would they ever take the approach of actually manufacturing their own boards because they're the ones that need all of that packaging? Um, for whatever it is they're building, would they ever take that approach? Like, would Ford do it? Would some other, you know, OEM in the U.S. do it? Yeah, you know, once again, I, I think you're hitting the nail on the head. You know, I always, you know, tell people that um, innovation is sometimes created out of crisis, right? So when you, when you, <laughs> you know, I've heard, you know, the saying, don't let a good crisis go to waste. And I think that's what we're seeing now is you're going to see, to your point, vertical acquisitions, either acquisitions or you're going to see green fields where a company that is you know, very reliant on semiconductors and printed circuit boards will look, especially if they have a lot of cash and if they can get the know-how, they may want to make sure that at least from their standpoint, they have a resilient supply chain. Um, without saying the name, there are right now OEMs that we're aware of that are doing just that. So where they would acquire a printed circuit board, they are now breaking ground to start producing their own. 
Um, I think you will see more of that because if you're, you know, one of these larger Fortune 100 companies that, you know, is is reliant heavily on certain, it doesn't even have to be semiconductors, but any sole source supplier or a difficult supply chain issue, should they have the means, and many of them do, the ones you've mentioned, I think that would be a good contingency plan if uh, if you're a CEO running one of those companies, right? Because I think, as we've seen, a lot of these companies are struggling just because they can't get supply, right? Demand is there, the supply is not, and that's really the catalyst behind inflation, right? You want to see inflation have, you know, demand outreach supply, and then you start paying $20,000 for containers, you know, your your beef gets more expensive, uh, it's hard to get pharmaceuticals, and the list goes on and on, right? You look at oil. Um, so we're, we're seeing the results of that, and I think some of these companies will look at, okay, let's start thinking about vertical vertical acquisitions, and acquisitions can either mean building, you know, the technology yourself or acquiring a company just to ensure that you have that um, resilient supply chain. It, it, it is a major shift. And I think it's encouraging to, to hear that uh, there are OEMs that are uh, yeah. pursuing that now. Um, so yes. I think we'll have to leave it at that. And I, I hope that uh, you and I can discuss some of these issues in the future should any of that uh, vertical acquisition start happening in mass. Uh, Travis, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, this has been a really enlightening discussion, and um, I know we've kind of talked economics here and, and policy, um, but I think it is really important for the for the industry to you know get out ahead of this stuff, and um, hopefully the PCBAA efforts will produce uh, much more legislation like this in the future to help keep American circuit board manufacturing competitive. Um, what we'll do is uh, in the show notes, we're going to link to uh, some uh, information on PCBAA, and um, we'd invite everybody to check that out and learn more about what this important organization is doing for the industry. Um, Travis, thank you so much again. And uh, to everybody that is out there listening, make sure to like this video, hit the subscribe button to see future episodes, and don't stop learning. Stay on track. We'll see you next time.